On July 8, 2015, 19-year-old Stephen Smith was found dead in the middle of a lightly traveled country road in South Carolina. The investigation revealed no answers as to what happened and who was responsible. It was an extremely tragic loss for his family, but it was a case that drew very little attention until the world found out about Alec Murdoch and his family. Then, all of a sudden, it became one of the stories linked to the Murdochs and linked to the nation's obsession with justice or lack of justice in the low country of South Carolina. The investigation into his death is one that has raised many more questions than it has answered. The case remains unsolved, but it's worse than that. It's not even clear how he died. Was he struck by a car? If so, was it an accident or was it done on purpose? Or was he bludgeoned to death and left dead in the road? Whatever happened to Stephen, one thing is clear. It was a crime and no one has been held responsible. Tonight, Stephen's mother, Sandra, joins us along with her attorney, Eric Bland, who is helping the family to get justice. Also with us this hour, the journalist and podcaster who broke the Murdoch story wide open, Mandy Matney. All this as we continue our investigation into the death of Stephen Smith. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments, big hour ahead. This is a story uh, we spent a lot of time uh, on earlier this year. It's time to catch up and figure out what's going on. And there's a big announcement related to Stephen Smith that we have for you tonight as well. But let's begin with Stephen Smith. I mean, it's been since 2015. That's a long time ago. That's a long, long time ago. Um, <clears throat> cold case. Not necessarily a cold case, maybe a case that wasn't getting the attention that it needed and the t attention that it warranted, and now it is. So uh, hopefully that's going to get us somewhere. But it happened back in 2015 and was like, as I said, way under the radar. I mean, it wasn't on our radar here at Court TV. Um, then all of a sudden, uh, the Murdoch docu-series is, is on Netflix and everybody in the world is watching and it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute. What, a, what about the death of this young man? Is anything being done there? So after watching the Netflix, I think a lot of people were, were saying, come on, we need, to, we need to figure out what happened here. Whether there is or is not a connection to anyone uh, in the Murdoch family. But you watch the Netflix series and, and it raises a lot of questions like, okay, it, it sounds like something that should absolutely be able to be solved. It seems like people would know and there should be some forensic evidence and you look at all of the um, circumstances surrounding it. And then when we took a closer look at it, it was like the way the investigation sort of ping-ponged between two different departments and agencies um, and then the ball was just dropped, like literally dropped. But hopefully we're in a different space now. And, and a lot of this, we've seen the momentum in the case. Uh, and again, it all began uh, when people became very aware of it uh, through the Netflix series, then shows like ours and others, uh, podcasts were, were, were zeroing in on all of this. And there's a spotlight. And the spotlight creates heat. And when there's heat, there's a reaction. And, you know, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division reopens the investigation. Then you've got um, a, a team put together uh, by the family to, to help uh, move things along. And there's a second autopsy and his body is exhumed. And you've got a new autopsy and you've got new uh, information that you're able to gather from all of that. And the momentum was really starting to build in this case. And then the latest we heard is that there's a grand jury involved in all of this. Now, if you've got a, a grand jury involved, a new autopsy, you've got SLED, SLED looking at all of this, it's like, okay, we've, we've got to be close. We've got to be close. Because it's, it's, this is not an unsolvable case by any means. I mean, we look at the... The stories and the, the, the murders we cover here, and some of them are a mystery, and they're a mystery because there's like, there's nothing there. Sometimes there's not even a body. Um, 
and, and then we look at the trials that we watch here on Court TV, and you're like, wow, how did they figure that out? They figured it out because they put some focus on it, some effort, and they, may, and they got to the bottom of what happened. And that's what needs to happen here. Now, for those of you not familiar with this story, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has more information for us tonight. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? Hello, um, I just going down the wrong Parkerville Road. Mm -hmm. I see somebody laying out. July 8, 2015, the body of 19-year-old Stephen Smith is found during the early morning hours, lying in the middle of a rural Hampton County two-lane road. Oh, uh, I ain't moving or nothing like that, but uh, somebody boy hit him. Stephen was a graduate of Wade Hampton High School and was studying to be a nurse. He also was openly gay in a community where that wasn't very common. I thought that from the beginning, you know, that it was done out of hate. It was not immediately clear to investigators what caused Stephen's death. There is no body trauma other than to the head area. He had a dislocated right shoulder and then all his eye socket was broke. The whole back of his head was crushed. There is some uh, scrapes and scratches on his left and right arm, on his knuckles, some across his face. Later that morning, police found Stephen Smith's car about three miles away, parked on the side of the road. The car was locked. He had his phone and his key in his pocket, but then he left his wallet. So if you're going to go get gas, why would you leave your wallet in the car? The medical examiner ruled Stephen's death the result of a hit and run, a finding that shocked his mother and the investigators. There was no damage anywhere. There was no debris in the road. It does not appear to be, in my opinion, uh, uh, struck by a vehicle. As police tried to determine exactly what had happened, Buster Murdoch's name kept coming up. Some of his friends came over, him and Stephanie's friends, and they said, you know, it was in Murdoch boys that did this. You know, we never thought that. But then it just kept coming over and over and over again. Investigators never figured out how the rumors began, and Buster Murdoch strongly denied any involvement, calling them baseless, and said his heart went out to Stephen's family. The investigation into Stephen's death stalled for six years, until June of 2021, when the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch thrust the case into the national spotlight. It was then that Sled reopened the investigation and officially ruled Stephen Smith's death a homicide. Okay, we've got some special guests joining us tonight from Hilton Head Island in South Carolina, Stephen Smith's mother, Sandy Smith, and with her, the author of the soon-to-be-released book, Blood on Their Hands, Murder, Corruption, and the Fall of the Murdoch Dynasty. And if this book is anything like the podcast, it's going to be amazing. And, of course, she's also the creator of the Murdoch Murder Podcast and another podcast which everyone's listening to, Cup of Justice. Mandy Matney is with us. And in Columbia, South Carolina, tonight, the attorney uh, for Stephen Smith's family. He's also uh, the host of that Cup of Justice podcast with Mandy. Eric Bland is with us. Okay, I am so glad everyone is here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandy, I want to begin with you. And I want to right off the top here because I know um, there's a big announcement about a, a scholarship that you are now, uh, now going to be putting together. Can you explain to us uh, what it is and how it came to be? It came to be through the generous people who donated to the GoFundMe. And we were able to put aside the $30,000 for the reward. And then we put $25,000 in a scholarship fund for the, with the community foundations of the low country. And it is to help young people who want to go to college, but doesn't really have the means. And they struggled like Steven struggled. And Steven struggled mainly with the workbooks and the scrubs because they were like $300 and $300. And, but you had to buy them from the school. There was no other way of getting it. And it was hard. And I feel like that that's what Steven would want us to do is to help others 
What an amazing thought. What an amazing uh, generosity. Let me put it up on the screen here so folks can see it. Um, it's the Stephen Nicholas Smith Memorial Scholarship uh, established, obviously, in loving memory of Stephen Nicholas Smith by his family and friends. The mission, again, is to provide annual scholarship support for qualified students with financial need who are in pursuit of post-secondary education with a preference for the field of nursing. Um, Eric Bland, I'll go to you really quickly. You know, the, the money, right? There, there was such gen generosity and an outpouring of support. And there was some money. And amazingly, um, now that's going to be used to help um, young people like, like Stephen. Yes. Uh, first, I'd like to say good evening, Vinny, and uh, thank you so much for doing this story. The only way that we can make progress is if we have a focus on Stephen's investigation and Stephen's death. And you doing this is very important. I also like to say hello to Mandy and Sandy, two of the most beautiful women in my life, um, who I value so much. Um, yes, I mean, it, it is amazing what Sandy has done. She has not taken one single penny from any of the money that has been raised through uh, GoFundMe and any other charitable donations. Uh, there hasn't been any attorney's fees. All the money has gone to pay experts, to pay for the exhumation, to pay for the uh, reinterment of Stephen, um, the second autopsy report. Um, it, this, is, this wasn't designed to enrich Sandy. This was to start the fire. And you know, what happens with cold cases, Vinny, there's a lot of flurry in the beginning, and then they tend to, you know, the investigation tends to wane a little bit. And what happens here now is Alex, with his new uh, plea and the new shenanigans by his lawyers daily and appeals and the Corey Fleming, it's stealing the oxygen away from Stephen's investigation. And quite frankly, I'm a little frustrated with SLED. Um, I, I and beginning to voice that frustration because I think we're entitled to know more than just we're making progress. Um, I'm not asking for the granular details, but Sandy Smith has been patient. She's been uh, backburnered so many different times over the last six, seven years, and now she's being backburnered again. It looks like with what Alex is, what's what going on with Alex, both in state and federal court. Mandy. Great to see you. Let's let's talk about um, your thoughts and, and your perspective um, on Stephen's case and what has happened to Stephen Smith and, and how it related to uh, Murdoch and where we are now. Yeah, so I met Sandy actually in 2019 when I was investigating the boat crash that killed Mallory Beach. I had seen a bunch of memes on Facebook and heard a lot of chatter, people saying they want justice for Stephen and Mallory. And I knew nothing at that point. And the first question was, well, who's Stephen? And a couple days later, I was at Sandy's door and I met her in 2019. I was thinking about that today and how far we've come in the last few years, but how far we still have to go. And I, I've no, gotten to know Sandy very well in the last few years. We've become very close and I've, as a journalist and now as a friend too, I just have seen the ups and downs that she has to go through. And with I've seen her get so excited and I, I remember you called me the first day, the day that the investigation was reopened and we both cried because uh, that's all that she wanted. She just wanted that validation. And then again, she got some more validation when SLED called this a murder and said that they were focusing on it back in March. And now here we are again and just needing answers. And I'm with you, Vinny. This case absolutely can be solved. That was one of the first things that I noticed when I started investigating this back in 2019 is that there's a lot there. It, they just need people to open up. They just need, There are people, I believe, who are keeping secrets on behalf of who knows. We do not know who killed Stephen. And we are not saying that the Murdochs did it by any means. And Sandy is not saying that either. Um, we are just saying that they, we need answers and we need people to talk. And to do that, 
this is what we need to be doing. We need to be putting Stephen in the spotlight again. So thank you again for having us. We really appreciate it. So Mandy, in, in your investigation, and you know, I've looked at it as well, and, and I've got my take. Why do you think that you know a case going back to 2015, here we are in, in 2023, and we still don't have an answer, uh, Sandy doesn't have justice. Why do you think that is? I think, unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, I think people know what happened, and I think that they chose themselves and to protect other people instead of worrying about a grieving mother and caring about Sandy Smith and her family and actually stopping to think about what it does to them every single night and every single day, knowing that their son was killed and they have no answers. I think that there's a lot of selfish people out there who do know what happened. And I think that they have believed all this time that this is just gonna go away, that Steven's story is going to die down and they can sweep it under the rug. But this is another example. This is just another chapter. We're all going to keep going. There's so many people who love Sandy as it's very evident from the $130,000 raised very quickly. Uh, people love Steven so much and people really, really want his case to be solved. No matter who did it, we just need answers. Absolutely. Okay, Mandy and Sandy will stay with us. Eric Bland will stay with us. Uh, when we come back, we're going to take you back to the scene to get a little more uh, insight into what happened that day. Plus, coming up next hour. <laughs> In Chaffee County, Colorado, wife and mother of two, Suzanne Morphew, disappeared from her home on Mother's Day in 2020. While she was still missing, her husband was charged with her murder, but then the charges were dropped. But now her remains have been recovered, and we have the latest in this very unconventional case. There's going to probably be a lot more questions now than ever because, I mean, who did it? Why? Why is she there? What did, what happened to her? You know, just a lot. So now they have their body, and now let's, let's finish the job. There's a tragic outcome in this case. Civil trial that is the focus of the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. How a misdiagnosis tore their family apart. They continue to accuse Jack and Beata of being child abusers. Jack called me and said Beata just hung herself. Is the hospital they're suing responsible for what happened? The Take Care of Maya trial. Trial coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. in Hampton County where Stephen Smith's body was found in 2015. There's now a memorial to honor his memory at this location. This is an area that is remote. There's a cornfield on one side of the highway. There's trees on this side of the highway. And here you can see it's only about 20 yards from the nearest home. Chanley Painter returned uh, to the scene when we were all down there uh, covering uh, the Murdoch trial and covering the story as well. Um, she went back another time with uh, the star of the Murdoch trial, the expert witness, uh, uh, Kenny Kinsey, uh, who after this interview became part of the team looking at the death of uh, Stephen Smith. Let's take a look at what Chanley and uh, Ken Kinsey had to say. I'm here on Sandy Run Road in rural Hampton, South Carolina, the location where 19-year-old Stephen Smith's body was found in the early morning hours of July 8, 2015. We are digging into the investigation file, and in that effort, we wanted to tap into some expert resources. So I had Dr. Kenny Kenzie meet me here at this location. He, of course, is an expert in crime scene reconstruction, and I can't wait, Dr. Kenzie, to hear your thoughts. I know that you've also read the file. Now that we're here on location, what's standing out to you? Ms. Chanley, I, I noticed some features in the landscape that have remained constant in the last seven or eight years. A lot has changed, the dynamics of the highway, the uh, pavement, some of the paint, but I can also isolate 
several features that helps me put the location down to a pinpoint. Maybe not a point of origin, but at least an area of origin where Mr. Smith's body was located. And that's key to kind of understand maybe what happened, you know, how his body was positioned at the time that those first responders arrived here at the scene, right? It is. See that one point right here? And then the box extends over the actual line. So Got head it. this direction, feet that direction. Feet that direction. Yes, ma'am. Right here, literally on the, on the on the center line, it looks like. Yeah, he did straddle the center line. I don't know the exact position because I haven't seen the exact photos, but uh, right. somewhere in this in this area. What is the position here in the middle on the center line tell you? Well, Miss Chanley, it's so many different ways, and, and I don't want to... I, I don't want to state a method because I really don't know that part. It does look a little odd to me, uh, the lack of damage to Mr. Smith's clothing. I mean, I've, I, I'm not a trooper. I haven't ever been a trooper, but I have assisted on a number of pedestrian uh, versus vehicle accidents. And I don't know that I've ever seen clothing in that pristine a condition. Uh, from a vehicle versus pedestrian accident. And the positioning on the middle line, I mean, at bare minimum, I don't think a person could mistakenly hit someone and not know they hit someone. There is a lot of, you can see kind of far down in this direction, that there's a slight curve here in the road. Does that indicate anything or would affect anything? There is, but in the original photographs and right now, they keep the shoulder cut back. So you still got plenty of field of view. You may not get it in the highway, you know, from a, a distance, but you should still see something moving. And those headlights are going to light it up for several hundred feet. The lack of physical evidence here at the scene. Talk to me about that. Well, typically, Ms. Chanley, you're going to have car parts, plastic, glass. You know, those lenses, they, uh, they don't hold up to a lot of impact. And the ones that I have worked that were intentional, and also the ones I've assisted Highway Patrol with, I, I believe there's always been debris. Right, like to the point. You I would mean, see something. This is not obviously from a car, but just uh, maybe the bumper or paint. Oh, or exactly. Glass. There's no evidence really of swerving, right, from what you see in those photos. In none of the photos I've seen, Chanley, uh, when you slam on brakes, you're going to leave tire material on the pavement. It's going to show definitely the uh, tire span, the width of that vehicle. Sometimes if you stop fast enough, it's going to leave a direct impression in that rubber. But if you can find that at a crime scene right. and you can find a suspect tire, a lot of times you can use those characteristics to include or exclude that tire. None of that's here on the seat. And it's probably changed in eight years. If right. that vehicle is still around, of course, we change our shoes. Well, you have to change your car tires too. Good so point. it may be knowledge, some person's knowledge that they have to depend on. The key here is someone knows. Someone knows because people can't be quiet and somebody knows and they're scared to come forward for whatever reason. But somebody knows and, and the Smith family deserves answers. Sandy Smith, uh, Stephen's mom still with us, Mandy Matney, Eric Bland as well. And, and Sandy, um, amazing folks who are helping out from uh, the team that, that Eric and his partner put together. Um, wh what are your thoughts about that, that night? I mean, would he be walking down the middle of the street? I mean, these are, I'm not from the country, but if I was walking down that street in the middle of the night, there's not a lot of traffic, I think I would see or hear a car approaching. Right, and Stephen and his sister and the friends, they walk the roads at night sometimes, and if a car was coming towards them, well, they would see, hear a car or see lights, they would jump in the woods and hide and then wait on that car to pass and then they would get back in the road and start walking again. That, that makes Stephen sense. It's, it's the middle of the night, yeah. right? It's, it's the early morning hours. There's no street right. lights there. There's no, right. there's not traffic. There, I mean, I think when I was there, I don't know if there were three cars that may have passed through that area. Um, right. All of these roads are very, you know, middle of the day. There you have it. Oh, there goes one car. You know, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait another 20 minutes. Maybe you'll see another one. Eric. Right. As I, as I, so you're, you've, 
you expressed the level of frustration and explain to us how the team you've put together um, is working or communicating with SLED. How is that relationship um, working or not working? Um, it's more of a one-way highway, but that's come to be expected. You know, our um, the pathologist did his second autopsy report. It was given to SLED. Um, Dr. Michelle Dupree did a report. It was given to SLED. Dr. Kenny Kenzie did a report. It was given to SLED. And they asked us not to release it publicly because it would interfere with their investigation. And, you know, again, we were very excited and, um, and excited to cooperate and cooperate with their requests. And we still are. The frustration for me is this cone of silence that is existing about Stephen's death. Not sure who did it. I don't really um, get mired down in that. But I know that people know how he died. And justice for me, for uh, Sandy looks a little bit like this. She doesn't want to tar and feather anybody, put anybody on a post and burn them at the stake. She just wants to get answers on how her son died. She needs peace. You know, a mother that has to live not knowing how her son died never gets a good fresh breath of air or a good night's sleep. So she wants answers. Then the second component of justice is holding somebody properly accountable. You know, if it's somebody that hit Stephen and then fled the scene, then it's fleeing the scene of an accident. If it's somebody that intentionally tried to scare Stephen and it got out of control, well, then we'll have to hear the story. But mainly, number one, is I'm trying to get answers for this woman so that she can go on with her life and not be haunted by the memory of Stephen's death. She deserves that. Every mother deserves that. Ah. And I feel like that SLED, um, again, I, you know, they're doing what they're doing. I don't get the inside 411 on what's going on. But every time we have a Murdoch fire drill, whether it's this new jury issue or it's Alex pleading guilty in federal court or whatever, the oxygen just goes. And it goes right to Alex. And that's the, the pernicious effect that this miscreant has had on our state. Mandy, going back to the scene where this happened and this road, and um, to me, I, you know, accidents could, can happen, I guess. It just seems like someone driving down the road would see him if he happened to stay in the road. If he's in the road, like Sandy said, you hear or see a car, regardless of how fast it is, you look at where he was found and you look how long the stretch of road is and how quiet it is there and how peaceful, especially in the early morning hours. Does any of this, what, what makes sense to you as to what could have happened here? Well, I think one big thing that has always stuck out to me is uh, Stephen's wounds and Stephen was most most of his trauma was in was on his head and if you think about that how could a car and they hypothesize that a truck near could do that and he had abrasions a little bit of abrasions on his arms but most of the damage to his body was on the front of his face correct the, the front of his head the, the whole um all this was crushed. Right, uh, the, his head was crushed. But if you think, if you stop and think about that, how could a vehicle hit somebody primarily in the head and, like Dr. Kinsey said, pretty much leave their clothes untouched? It seems almost impossible. And you combine that with just so many weird things that happen in the investigation, and you combine that with the lack of evidence of a vehicular homicide on the scene, and you comb through those reports and look for anybody in the highway patrol who believes that it w that this was a vehicle accident, and no, none of them did. No. They all said, I found no evidence of a vehicular homicide here. So I don't understand for the life of me how this was, this case was in the highway patrol's hands for as long as it was, because it should not have been the highway patrol's case. It should have been, it should have been SLED's case in 2015. 
Yes. Sandy, how do you think he got where he was found from his car that we're looking at here? Because they're about three miles in separation, right? The car's about three miles away from where he was found. How do you think he got there? I'm thinking someone placed him there because the reason being, he had his cell phone. It wasn't far from the house. He would have called Stephanie to come and get him or bring him gas. Because he has run out of gas before, and the first thing he does is call his sister. And she always come and picked him up. So I don't see him walking that far. Yeah, he, he has a cell phone. That's, that's the great thing about, you know, getting stuck on the road these days. Everyone has a cell phone. You make the right. call. It's, it's very simple. All right, Sandy, Mandy, Eric Bland, stay where you are. When we come back, we're going to take a listen to some of those police interviews that were done early on and how people were mentioning Buster Murdoch's name. hard all my life. I've gone from being a local reporter to becoming a law student to then even going on to teach other lawyers all before I came to Court TV. As a journalist, lawyer, and teacher, I learned the secret to success is speaking in your authentic voice. And I bring that lesson to my show, Opening Statements, every morning on Court TV. Opening Statements with Julie Grant. Weekday mornings at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. On a, z a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being like very, very illuminating, uh, 0 being doesn't tell you anything, how much did this second autopsy tell you about uh, what happened to Stephen Smith? Um, actually, Vinny, I think it was close to a 10. Really? Really. We were able to do everything we needed to do, and again, it was, um, it was almost as if we were doing the first autopsy. The only thing that we did not do was toxicology. Um, and we have the results from the first autopsy on that, so they weren't needed. Um, but we did everything else that you would expect in a regular autopsy. We were able to, again, get the information that we needed. And really, this is now, um, this is sort of now in the hands of the investigators. Um, that's where a lot of this, this key information is going to lie. We're hoping that somebody who does know something, because somebody does, will come forward and sort of fill in a few of the missing pieces that we don't have. That was back in April, right here on Closing Arguments, Dr. Uh, Michelle Dupree, um, a 10, a 10 out of 10 in how illuminating the second autopsy was, which was great news, right? And then again, it was, as Eric Bland has told us, handed it off to SLED. And, and here we are now, it's September, still waiting to find out um, more about what's going on. What is, the, what is the grand jury? What type of evidence are they hearing? What are they doing? Um, now, at the, at the time, you go back to 2015, there were a series of interviews that were done with people. And uh, we have audio recordings of, the, of those interviews. And everyone says, well, how did the Murdochs even come up in this? Well, they came up in this because of what people were saying to investigators. Take a listen. Can you tell me what you heard about the Stephen Smith incident? You heard what? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and who was that? Okay. Um, and I'll and I'll be honest with you, Tatiana. Buster Murdoch's been on our radar long before this. Another friend of mine had texted me asking me if Buster and Stephen were together, and I told him no. I said not that I knew of, and then I asked him why. He said because he had heard that, and then I asked him who he heard it from, and he said he didn't know, he just heard it. 
Okay, so he didn't have any real uh, anything to base that upon, just except for a, more or less a rumor. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's how, uh, you know, everyone was talking about Buster Murdoch in particular, but how the Murdoch name got uh, intertwined in, in the death of Stephen Smith. Let's bring back in our guest, Stephen's mom, Sandy Smith, <laughs> Manny Matney, author of the new book, Blood on Their Hands, and Eric Bland, the attorney uh, representing Sandy Smith's family. So, Sandy, what do you make of low country rumors? Do you, do you take them with a big grain of salt? Um, what do you think? Well, I do take it with a grain of salt. And when they first told Stephanie, it upset Stephanie when they said that Buster killed your brother. And she came to me crying and I said, Stephanie, you got to overlook what people say. People's going to talk, especially because of your brother's lifestyle. I said, so I don't see any reason why they would have any reason for killing Stephen. And Mandy, you, you talk about, and, and everyone keeps saying it, right? Dr. Kenny Kinsey, uh, um, Dr. Michelle Dupree, talking about the fact that someone's got to say something. Well, initially people were saying something. There were these rumors. I mean, you, you try to trace a rumor. It could be just one person started it, and then it just spread like wildfire from there, just out of thin air. Um, but the irony is, is that the rumors are what sort of put the uh, Murdoch family and Buster in the middle of all this, yet no one um, has come forward with the, with the information that investigators need to make an arrest here. Right, and I think that... The... Who's going to go? Mandy first, then, then Eric will close us out. I think we lost Mandy's microphone. Do we hear? We don't hear her. So, Eric, you take over for a second. We don't know that. We don't know if anyone um, hasn't talked yet. We haven't heard from SLED. We obviously are not going to hear from the grand jury because it's a secret proceeding. Look, do I believe Buster Murdoch killed uh, Stephen Smith? The answer is I have no idea. I, I think it would be patently unfair to put that blame on uh, that young man at this time. Now, there was one question that wasn't asked of him in the Fox Nation documentary, and they asked him, did you have a relationship with Stephen Smith? No. Did you kill Stephen Smith? No. The follow-up question, which would have been the first question we wanted an answer to is, do you know what happened to Stephen Smith? And that wasn't asked of any. And we do believe that, that Buster has some knowledge and amongst some of his friends, there's at least five or six people who are persons of interest, not necessarily because they were involved in Stephen's death, but they have knowledge of what happened to him. And that's the cone of silence that we talked about. And, you know, the Murdoch cone of silence is very scary in that uh, part of the um, state. You know, in the documentary, you heard that, um, um, Alex's wife, Maggie, told uh, Paul's girlfriend, look, this is the kind of family you're getting into. When Randolph's wife, Miss Libby, was going to leave him, he posted an obituary of her in one of the Low Country papers. Now, that is frightening. Wow, that is cold. And she didn't leave him. That, that is, is cold. frightening. And that tells you the kind of people that uh, these Murdoch's are and that they, they wield a lot of power. So... I don't necessarily agree with Mandy in part that they're just being selfish and not uh, stating it. I think there's some people that are legitimately afraid if they open their mouth. And it's the duty of SLED to protect these people. So, Mandy, where do you think we are right now in terms of what the, the temperature is down there, right? The Murdoch dynasty has blown up, right? We, we witnessed it ourselves. Go ahead. All right. Um, well, Eric, I just want to say, like, I understand, and I don't want to say that people are being selfish, but times have changed in the low country, and I live in the low country, and I was terrified in 2019 when I started investigating this case and others associated with the Murdoch family. And back then was a different ball game that we were talking about when we were trying to talk about the Murdoch family. 
Now, times are different. Alec Murdoch was convicted of murder, of murder in a fair trial that I believe was fair, but that's another <laughs> situation. That's another episode. Um, <laughs> that's another episode. But oh, yeah. I, I don't think that that's an excuse anymore to be scared. Look at this woman. Look how much pain she's been in. Like, it's time for people to stop being scared and start thinking about other people's feelings. There's no excuses anymore. And SLED is, I believe that SLED can get this job done as long as people cooperate and step up and they end this cone of silence. And they, I, I, we're done of the days of having excuses for people being silent anymore. I don't think that they should be afraid. I think that they should just do what is right and come forward. And go ahead. Okay. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's right. Well stated. Sandy Smith, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for having me. Amazing work with that scholarship. Uh, good luck with that. We're so glad thank you. we were able to announce that tonight. Manny Matney, November 14th, the book is coming out? It is. Where are people find it? November like, 14th. You're going to find it everywhere, uh, right? They can pre-order on Amazon and bloodontheirhandsbook.com. Awesome, awesome. And Eric Bland, what you've done down there and i want to remind folks you're, you're taking no fees for this work that you're doing which is like the opposite of alec murdoch right so like like alec murdoch takes your money doesn't do anything for you and then eric bland doesn't take any money and does everything for you so uh we appreciate your time as well thank well, you i appreciate everyone. that all right have a great night everyone thank you yeah, thank you eric thank you for having us